Greetings, my name is Barry Setterfield. Welcome to this presentation. In June of 2018, a scientific development occurred which was published in the journal Nature. This development relates to the origin of the elements, the origin of the universe, the Big Bang, and all related subjects. This development threatens to overturn 50 years of teaching in astronomy, and as a consequence, is of some importance. Let us introduce the topic in the following fashion. The various elements are the basic building blocks of all matter. For example, there is the element aluminum, out of which most aircraft, as well as drink cans, are made. Its symbol is AL. The element iron, FE, is used in some metal objects like cast iron cooking pans, and so on. Some elements are solid, like the gold, AU, in wedding rings. Some are liquid, like the mercury, HG, in special thermometers or barometers. Some are gas, like helium, HE, used to inflate balloons. Some elements, like carbon, are very common. Some are rare, like uranium, whose symbol is U. In all, 94 elements are found in nature. In labs, we've been able to produce several more to bring the number to 118. The simplest element is hydrogen, H. An atom of hydrogen has one proton of positive charge making up the central nucleus and one negatively charged electron circling it. The first photo of a hydrogen atom is shown here, taken in May 2013. The next simplest atom is helium, HE, which has two positively charged protons in its nucleus and two negatively charged electrons circling the nucleus. The elements become more and more complex as successively more and more protons are added to the nucleus and more and more orbiting electrons maintain an electrically neutral atom. Near the end of the line is the element uranium with 92 protons in its nucleus and a corresponding 92 electrons. In addition to protons, all elements except hydrogen also have electrically neutral particles called neutrons in their nucleus. The number of neutrons in the nucleus increases for successive atoms. So the next element to hydrogen, that is helium, has two neutrons in addition to its two protons. In the case of uranium, and in addition to its 92 protons, it can have anywhere from 141 up to 146 neutrons. When outside the nucleus, Neutrons are generally unstable and decay into a proton and an electron and energy in a short time, usually around 15 minutes. However, while neutrons are often stable within an atomic nucleus, they can still decay into protons and electrons even there. At very high temperatures and or pressures, this decay process can be reversed through something called electron capture. In electron capture, protons and electrons can combine to make neutrons. These reactions all occur in nuclear laboratories. Prior to the 1960s, the original Big Bang proposal was less complex than the current version. In the original proposal, the universe started off extremely hot and with high pressure. It was suspected of being composed entirely of light photons, electrons, protons and neutrons. The neutron decay reactions were balanced by the reactions which would build up neutrons at these temperatures and pressures. As the universe expanded, the mix then gradually cooled and the pressure dropped. As this process was occurring, the original Big Bang model suggested, as shown here, that neutrons and electrons would attach to protons and increasingly complex nuclei would be built up by this aggregation process. This can happen easily at those temperatures and pressures, since neutrons are electrically neutral and are therefore not repelled by protons. They can therefore attach to them quite readily. This also happens with electrons, as the opposite charges on protons and electrons attract. These processes are known from our laboratories and today are called neutron capture and electron capture, respectively. 
Because of the temperature and pressures involved, some neutrons in the nuclei will then decay back to protons, as happens today under appropriate conditions. In this way, by successively adding neutrons and protons to nuclei that had earlier been built up, the proposal stated that nuclei with varying degrees of complexity could be formed. This would have achieved the initial or first objective of accounting for the origin of all 94 naturally occurring elements listed on this chart. Indeed, experimental evidence from nuclear physics supports this research. It suggested that all the elements could be formed by this aggregation or capture process, starting with the original mix of unattached or isolated protons, neutrons and electrons. Isolated protons, electrons, neutrons and various atomic nuclei are referred to as the fourth state of matter, called a plasma. In 2009, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory stated that, and I quote, For some time after the Big Bang, the universe was so hot that all matter existed as plasma. End quote. These particles eventually came together to form atoms with their circling electrons. As a result, they are the basic building blocks of all matter. This is generally agreed upon. So plasma is matter in a formless state. In Genesis 1-2, we are told that the original matter was formless and vacuous. This is a good description of the start, even from a scientific point of view. We know that all elements are composed of these particles, but when and how and where are the matters of argument, and we'll get to that in a moment. The second objective of the pre-1960s Big Bang approach was to account for the relative abundance of the various elements using the aggregation or capture mechanism. Detailed calculations reveal that if the pressure in the original mix or plasma was too high, then too much hydrogen would be produced and too little uranium. The reverse situation also applied. We know the existing abundances of the elements that we have today. As a result, this capture process allowed details of the original pressure, temperature and timing to be worked out for events in the early universe. This suggested the capture or aggregation process had indeed been operating in the early cosmos. The results of this analysis were published in their final form in 1962 by Big Bang pioneer George Gamow. This was done in a book entitled The Creation of the Universe, where the nuclear aggregation process, as he called it, was detailed. The cover of that book is shown on the left, with the 2012 reprint on the right. But there was one problem with this original approach. Each new element with an additional proton or neutron had to be built up from the element before, which had one proton or one neutron less. The problem was that, experimentally, it was found that neither a proton nor a neutron can be attached to a helium nucleus, so that it remains there. This is due to the interplay of atomic forces. Furthermore, the conditions do not favour two particles being captured simultaneously by a helium nucleus to form a higher element. This was definitely a problem. Given this fact, all that can happen is that a few chance side reactions may produce very small quantities of lithium and beryllium from helium, nothing more. As a consequence, in the mid-1960s, Big Bang astronomy abandoned the capture or aggregation approach. This left them with the original two problems. First, how the various elements beyond helium formed. And second, how can the observed relative abundances of the elements be accounted for? Earlier, in 1957, a potential option had opened up and now began to look promising. This option demonstrated that all the other elements could be built up inside large stars by nuclear fusion processes rather than capture reactions. In fusion processes, 
Two smaller atomic nuclei are fused together to form a single, larger nucleus. By the end of the star's life cycle, heavier elements, including magnesium and iron, would have formed inside these stars. When these stars finally exploded as supernovas, they showered their nearby vicinity with all these elements. By the mid-1960s, the calculations of Professor Fred Hoyle in this area had become accepted and then fully adopted by the Big Bang proponents. Fred Hoyle had made the proposal and had done all the initial calculations. However, William Fowler, a co-author of Hoyle's paper on that discovery, received the Nobel Prize instead due to scientific politics. So here is how the first problem, the origin of the elements, is currently solved by the Big Bang model. Hydrogen and helium were produced initially by the Big Bang process itself. Then, massive supergiant stars formed whose temperatures and pressures were high enough to fuse hydrogen and helium into heavier elements in successive stages. Hydrogen would burn to helium. The helium would then burn to carbon, which then burned to neon. Neon then burned to become oxygen, which burned to become magnesium. Magnesium would then burn to silicon, which then burned to eventually become iron. The iron then built up in the core, at which stage the star would become unstable. The whole process is meant to be forming a layered star, rather like the skins of an onion, as this diagram shows. Another way of showing the expected reactions in that model is given here. It starts with hydrogen burning in the top left, and proceeds around the curve on the right to burn neon and magnesium. Eventually the process ends with the production of iron, at which stage the star catastrophically explodes, sending all these elements to join the gas cloud in space. The remains of a typical supernova explosion are shown here. We first saw the light from this explosion on the 4th of July in 1054 AD. It was visible in broad daylight and then faded over a two-year period. This is what it looks like today, and it is called the Crab Nebula. Obviously it will take some time for any elements it produced to spread through that vicinity. So the production of elements inside stars apparently overcame the first problem. But the Big Bang has a second problem namely how the elemental abundances in our galaxy and the rest of the universe can be accounted for. The suggestion is that the first stars exploded out the elements formed by fusion in their interiors. Those heavy elements then mix with the gas in the galaxy and forms new stars. These new stars then eventually explode out more elements from which other stars are formed. This third generation of stars then explodes out elements to enrich gas clouds that formed the Sun. So the current abundance of elements in our galaxy took at least three generations to form over a period of about 9.1 billion years. This follows as the Big Bang considers the Sun to be over 4.6 billion years old and the cosmos 13.7 billion. These current Big Bang answers to both problems disagree with what we actually see in space. The most distant and thus earliest objects visible in the universe are quasars, which existed shortly after the universe began. They are the ultra-brilliant centres of galaxies with polar jets, as illustrated here. Spectroscopes reveal that quantities of magnesium and iron exist in these earliest quasars. But on the standard model currently being followed, these heavier elements did not have time to form yet, let alone be built up to the observed abundances that early in the universe. Here is the graph of the elements found in distant quasars by the use of spectrometers. They include hydrogen, H, helium, He, carbon, C, nitrogen, N, oxygen, O, silicon, Si, iron, Fe, and magnesium, Mg. The graph also tells us the relative abundances of these elements, which is basically the same as we see throughout the universe today. 
As a result of these observations, a recent determination of the amount of iron and magnesium in distant quasars was done by Dietrich Dekval. The astounding result was that they found the abundance of iron and magnesium in most distant quasars is essentially the same as in nearby galaxies. From this, there were two conclusions that could be drawn. Conclusion 1. Heavy elements were already there in the cores of the earliest galaxies, the quasars. This presents a time problem. How did these elements get there so early? There was not enough time or generations of stars to form them that early on the standard model. Conclusion 2. Since there is little change in the abundances of the various elements over time, this suggests that all the elements were there almost from the beginning. How can that happen without stars? The answer had actually been given prior to 1960. Noblest Eugene Wigner pointed out that the problem of building up all of these elements in the initial Big Bang scenario could be overcome if the nucleus of just one other element was present in addition to hydrogen. It could be shown that all other elements could then be built up quickly under Big Bang plasma conditions. Wigner suggested that the extra element might be carbon. However, by the mid-1960s, calculations revealed that carbon was not a suitable candidate, so the idea was shelved and Hoyle's proposals about the nuclear reactions in stars were accepted instead. Nevertheless, shortly after 2000, Edward Bodrow, Professor of Chemistry at University of New Orleans, re-examined this earlier proposition and did some extensive calculations. He found that the element oxygen, not carbon, fulfilled all requirements. By 2010, he found mathematically that by using oxygen nuclei, all the elements could form rapidly, even before star and galaxy formation occurred. We have found many hydrogen clouds in the universe. The question then became, where was the missing oxygen? It was at this time that the search for missing matter in the universe became important. It should be pointed out that missing matter is not the same as dark matter. Missing matter is known matter composed of the heavy nuclei of ordinary elements. It was something that could be seen and found. Dark matter has been proposed to answer observational problems connected with galaxies, but so far is only a mathematical construct, as it has never actually been seen. We know that real matter is missing because of astronomical observations of the early universe. These observations include the echo of the Big Bang, known technically as the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, or CMBR, shown here. The density fluctuations in this CMBR, shown by the different colours on this image, give us this information. Other sources also give us this information. For example, it is supported by hydrogen cloud data in the early universe. These data sources reveal that the atomic nuclei produced by the initial Big Bang fall short of the expected total amount of matter by at least 30 to 40%. Some suggest even higher. Thus, some 30% of atomic nuclei have been missing and the search for them has been ongoing for almost two decades. The Hubble Space Telescope and European Space Agency's X-ray Multi-Mirror Mission, XMM-Newton, have been employed in the search for this missing matter. Since 2012, Professor Michael Schull and Charles Danforth of Colorado University, Boulder, have collected this data. On the 21st of June 2018, in the scientific journal Nature, they and their team announced the discovery. The missing matter had been found, and it consisted of oxygen nuclei. It was hidden as huge plasma filaments of oxygen nuclei lying between the ordinary galaxies and large galaxy clusters, shown here in orange and red. The oxygen filaments are illustrated here as yellow and green. 
Up until now, scientists had admitted that 30 to 50 percent of nuclei from the Big Bang event were missing. Those nuclei have just been shown to be oxygen, but there is something very strange about them, which is why they were not discovered before. In June 2018, the discovery was made that this missing oxygen only had one electron attached, instead of the usual eight. This is the reason it was not discovered earlier. No one had been looking for the signature of oxygen with a plus seven charge. This strong positive charge means it was highly ionised and so was in the form of plasma, like the rest of the particles in the initial Big Bang. But we can go even further. This also means that 30 to 40% of the nuclei in the Big Bang were oxygen, but roughly 70% were hydrogen nuclei. This means that there were roughly two hydrogen nuclei for every oxygen nucleus in the original plasma. Effectively, that means it was a water plasma, since water has two hydrogen nuclei for every oxygen. These developments had been anticipated by George Gamow back in 1960. He assumed that the right nucleus would eventually be found. He did calculations based on just this sort of scenario. Both Gamow's calculations and Boudreaux's math prove the scenario correct. As a result, Boudreaux stated all the elements could form this way very quickly in a very hot plasma. Gamow stated that under these conditions, all the elements in the universe could form, quote, in less time than it takes to cook roast duck and potatoes, end quote. So the elements we see in quasars and early galaxies were probably available from the very beginning. This certainly resolves the discrepancy between the observational and theoretical data. It also overcomes the difficulty of the massive numbers of supernovas needed to enrich every galaxy with the various elements. Amazingly, this also accords with the statements we find in Genesis 1 and verse 2. Genesis indicates that all matter was formed out of a water plasma. Genesis 1-2 says, literally in the Hebrew, and matter was formless and vacuous, and the Spirit of God was driving these waters. It seems that science has finally caught up with what the Scriptures have to say. Thank you very much for your time.